Hello, we're going to quickly go over all of the questions that they've asked in the past couple of years on the divergence theorem. Uh, these are uh, all from final exams. That's the only exam they show up on. And interestingly, every single exam in the last couple of years has had exactly one divergence theorem question, and it's always within the last three questions of the exam. So this is something that, uh, you know, will come up, but thankfully, at least in my opinion, it's much easier to wrap your head around and to actually go through the motions of compared to Stokes' theorem. Uh, I, I really, really dislike Stokes' theorem. But we know uh, our conditions for the divergence theorem. We need a closed surface. Those are the magic words. Uh, and we need to be finding, uh, it helps when we're finding outward flux or inward flux. Just flux in general is what we're looking for. And of course, in order to have flux, we need to be within a vector field. And so that's fine. And we know that our flux integral, uh, applying the divergence theorem, so the flux integral S F vector ds, this is equal to the volume integral of the divergence of F uh, d v. There we go. And so we can solve this uh, pretty pretty quickly. We know that our F of x, y, z is equal to 3x, 4x squared, y squared. And I should I should kind of specify up here, and we know that we know that the divergence of f is equal to del dot f, where the, the del operator in our case is going to be uh, d dx d dy, d, dz, and they're not, Z, they're not d's, but I say that in my head when I'm writing them, so uh, I'm going to keep doing that. So we can set up this dot product pretty easily. I like to do it vertically, so uh, d, dx is going to get crossed with 3x, d, dy is going to get crossed with 4x squared, and d, dz is going to get crossed with y, sorry, when I, I said cross that whole time, I mean dot, so we're dotting and adding the results. So we're going to get 3 plus 0 plus 0, and we find that this, uh, you know, adds up to 3. So because we're taking a volume integral of something that we can find the volume of uh, without really doing any calculus, this, this solid that we're in is a, a cylinder of uh, height 1 and radius 1. Because we're doing a volume integral and we've ended up with something that doesn't have any variables attached to it, we know that the, uh, this whole expression up here will just be equal to whatever factor we got multiplied by that volume. And so the volume of our cylinder is going to be uh, pi r squared h, and we can solve for this and find that our volume is pi multiplied by r3, and we get 3 pi. Okay, uh, yet another divergence theorem question. We see the magic words again in a slightly different way. Instead of, uh, what, what did they say, closed surface? Yeah, up here. Now we're getting a solid box. Uh, and our if we just set up our box to take a look at it, it's going to be 0 by 1 in the x direction, 0, uh, zero by 2 in the y direction, and 0 by 2 in the z direction. So hopefully what we'd like to have happen is that we do the divergence of f, get a some, some constant c, and multiply it by our volume, where in this case our volume would be 1 times 2 times 2, which is 4. That would be great, but we'll see in a sec. It doesn't actually work out that way. So we know that the divergence of f is just going to be uh, del dot f, which we can set up, x squared y z comma x y squared z comma x y z squared, all of that's equal to f, and then we know that del is 
partial, partial x, partial, partial y, partial, partial z. I'm saying partial now. Okay, that's that's different. Uh, and when we compute all this, we'll get 2xyz plus 2xyz plus 2x. Y, Z, which is going to be 6, X, Y, Z. So uh, kind of disappointing that we didn't get something that we can uh, just skip uh, the integration on, but this integration really isn't that bad because uh, we're just doing a volume integral and we're in a, a rectangular prism. So all of our bounds are going to be constants. We see that we're bounded in every case uh, by 0 on the bottom. X is bounded by 1 on the top, y is bounded by 2, and z is bounded by 2. So if I move this over to give myself some space, we can start computing this. So taking our, our inner integral first, uh, just kind of pulling that out, integral from 0 to 1, 6, x, y, z, dx, we will get 3x squared, y, z on 0, 1, which is just 3yz. Now we're integrating this on 0 to 2 dy, which we can do pretty pretty easily. 3 halves y squared z on 0 to 2, which will just be uh, 6z. And integrating this, 3z squared on 0 to 2 will be 12. Okay, we are finding the flux out of the box with six faces, and they don't actually say closed or solid, but uh, since, you know, our general conception of a box, when, when, when you think of a box, you think of this kind of rectangular prism-looking thing, which has six faces. So really, they, they are telling us that, that our box is solid, which lets us do the, uh, or closed, which lets us use the divergence theorem, but this is just a, this is a pretty weird way of saying it. So we know, just like before, uh, we need the divergence of f, which is going to be partial, partial x, partial, partial y, partial, partial z, and we're dotting that with z squared, xy, y squared. So doing this, doing the stop product, we'll get 0 plus x plus 0. And we see that the divergence of f is just x. And so now all we have to do, just like before, uh, is set up our little triple integral. We're in a nice rectangular prism again. So we can go, go integral, integral, integral. Our integrand is going to be x. And dx runs from 0 to 1. dy runs from 0 to 2 and dz runs from 0 to 3. Now computing, x squared over 2 on 0 to 1 is 1 half. Uh, and since we're, we're out of variables, all we're going to do is multiply. Uh, if we, you, could, you can run this through yourself, but if our integrand is 1 half and we're uh, evaluating it on 0 to 2 and then 0 to 3 after integrating, well, all we're going to do is multiply this guy by the product of uh, 2 and 3. So we're going to multiply by 6 and get 3. OK, we are, let's see, we're looking for a flux integral. So we're already thinking this might be the divergence theorem. And look at that. We found the magic word, the solid enclosed by the cylinder uh, of radius 1 oriented on the z-axis and two z planes. So our surface, I think it's always good to draw the surface out to just start off with so that if you do take your divergence and it is a constant, uh, you can save yourself some time. So it has a height of two because we're running between negative one and one, and then we're just a cylinder with radius one. So let's take our uh, divergence of f. We know that that's uh, f dot del, or del dot f, the order in this case doesn't matter, although we know that with Stokes theorem, uh, it does matter, and, ha and it has to be del cross f for things to make sense. But we can set this up, f of x, y, 
z is equal to 2xy squared, 2yx squared, and negative x squared plus y squared times z. And we are dotting this with partial, partial x, partial, partial y, and partial, partial. That's not a z, but we'll, we'll say it is. So taking our dot product, we will get 2y squared plus 2x squared minus x squared minus y squared, which will just give us x squared plus y squared. And since we know that our integral uh, otherwise is going to be a cylindrical integral, we are in a cylinder after all. We want to run from 0 to 2 pi, 0 to 1, and 0 to 2. And we could do negative 1 to 1, uh, but since uh, our integrand is only dependent on r, r doesn't change as we change uh, height in z, and so I'm just going to set it from 0 to 2, uh, just to make things a little, little more simple. So we know that our integrand is x squared plus y squared, which is equivalent to r squared, and we know that there'll be an r in the integral already because we converted two cylindrical coordinates. So r cubed dz dr d theta. We're not dependent on theta at all. We can get rid of this for in exchange for a 2 pi. And we are not dependent on z at all, so we can get rid of this in exchange for a 2. So then we're only left with one integral. And I'll get rid of these so it's a little bit more clear. And r to the fourth over 4 evaluated on 0, 1 is just going to be 1 fourth. And so finally, 4 pi times 1 fourth is just pi. Okay, so we are uh, doing another divergence theorem integral where uh, we're, we're, we're computing, let's see, yes, the outward flux, yes, of, of, of our surface. And if we take a look, our surface is a sphere with radius 2, and we are in the first octant because we need x, y, and z to be positive. So we know for our divergence theorem, uh, we want to take, uh, we're going to take uh, del dot f, so we can set that up, partial, partial x, partial, partial y, partial, partial z, and then setting our, up our components of f, x, y, oops, xy squared plus 1, yz squared plus, oops, sorry, minus x, and zx squared plus y. So now taking our dot product, we'll get y squared plus z squared plus x squared. And so we know that since we're already taking a spherical integral, because we're dealing with the volume, uh, our, our volume is uh, you know, an eighth of a sphere, we will we'll, we'll be able to turn this into rho squared. So we can set up our integral. Uh, we want the volume of a sphere in the first octant. So we know that phi and theta have to run between zero and pi over two. And we know that we're dealing with a sphere of radius two. So rho is going to run between 0 and 2. And we know that uh, adding in our rho squared and multiplying by rho squared sine phi, like we always do, will give us our integral d rho d phi d theta. And we're, of course, we're not dependent on theta at all. We can remove all that and replace it with a pi over 2. So. Uh, pulling out our first integral, integral from 0 to 2 of rho to the 4th d rho, we will get rho to the 5th over 5 on 0 to 2, which is going to be 32 over 5. And 
Okay, so we got 32 over 5. Uh, I'm going to make a little bit more space. I'm going to move that out here, 32 over 5, and get rid of our inner integral sine phi. And we can just evaluate this, and then we'll have our answer. So negative cosine of phi after taking the antiderivative evaluated on 0 to pi over 2 will give us 0. And this will give us negative 1. And so overall, this is equal to 1. And so looking over here, we have 1 times 32 pi over 10, which is going to be 16 pi over 5. And there's our answer. And finally, we are evaluating a flux integral just like we always do. And at this point, uh, we, we, can, we can start cutting a couple steps because we're pretty used to everything. We're just going to take our uh, dot product without writing all that stuff out. We will get 3y squared plus 0 plus 3z squared. And we see that we're in the solid region bounded by this cylinder oriented on the x-axis. So if we draw this thing out, it won't be going up and down on the z axis like we're used to, it will actually be coming uh, out on the x-axis. And we're also bounded by the planes x is equal to 1 and x, e x is equal to 3. So we can still set this up as a normal cylindrical integral, and we'll just replace every z with an x um, to, to make things easier, and replace every x with a z. So Setting things up, we know we want the whole cylinder, so theta runs from 0 to 2 pi. R is going to run from 0 to root 2. That's not a 2. 0 to root 2, because, uh, you know, r squared, square root, will get root 2 over here. And then finally, z is going to run from 1 to 3. Remember, we're treating every x, x as a z. And then we can... Uh, start putting things in. This is 3r squared. And we know that since this is just a normal cylindrical integral, we multiply by r. dz, dr, d theta. And like usual, we're not dependent on theta at all. So we can move that out, get that out of there, and just put a 2 pi in its place. We're also not dependent on z, so we can remove this and multiply by 2. Or pi. There we go. So now simplifying this down to 3r cubed, we can just evaluate this as 3 fourths r to the fourth on 0 to root 2. Well, root 2 to the fourth is going to be 4. So this will be 3 fourths times 4, which is 3. 3 times 4 pi is 12 pi. And we're done. Hope that was a good uh, introduction they seem to, uh, uh, no, notably, they always use an outward orientation. Uh, if, if they ask for an inward orientation, all you have to do is flip the sign of uh, the answer that you get for what, what, what we would normally compute. But really, in the end, I, I doubt they're going to do that. It seems like they have a pretty strong trend of only using inward orientation. But as you can see, these divergence theorem problems are relatively uh, easy if you know the formula. They're much nicer than Stokes theorem problems, where you can know the formula, uh, know how to apply it, and get stuck down a rabbit hole of parametrizing a sphere and uh, never, never find your way out. So, you know, divergence theorem is your friend in, in comparison.